This is Physical Chemistry, Chapter 8, Section 1. We're just about to begin Quantum Mechanics. Now, to refresh your memory, Classical Mechanics is what they had before 1900, roughly speaking, around the near century, of course. So, uh, there was Classical Physics, that's basically not Newton's Laws of Motion, and then we had the Maxwell Theory for Electricity, then we had Magnetism, we had Thermodynamics, we had the Kinetic Theory of Gases, like the G-Function and the Maxwell Distribution, but it's also important to remember we um, found the heat capacity of certain molecules, like um, carbon dioxide, the molar heat capacity, constant volume, and um, this will give you the wrong value. So roughly 1900 is when people started to realize that some of this stuff is not quite right. Continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1. We're talking about the failures of classical mechanics um, now. There are at least two of them. So this is the 1900s when uh, scientists were realizing that classical mechanics was not quite working. So one, this is number, but they're not really in any particular order. I already mentioned the heat capacity of molecules. They don't come out right. And for one, according to classical physics, the heat capacity of a molecule, there's no reason for it to be temperature dependent. At any temperature, the molecules should be able to store that energy in the appropriate ways, the degrees of freedom. But we're going to show that heat capacity is actually dependent on temperature, and we're going to show how quantum mechanics explains why that is. Then the second uh, failure of classical mechanics is black body radiation. This is going to take a little bit to explain, so um, we're going to do it graphically, numerically here. So remember, nu is frequency, we covered that last term, and we've got a distribution function here, capital R, not the gas constant, or Rydberg constant, obviously. So this is a function of nu, and what it is is the uh, rate of emitted radiation, or well, we're specifically talking about light, or electromagnetic radiation, or divided by the unit surface area of an object. Again, we're going to talk about what that is on the next slide. So R is a distribution function. Okay, continuing physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1. So I explained on the previous slide what R is, this is the distribution function based on a, a frequency. So here we are, frequency is the horizontal axis. And what happens is at 500 kelvins, you're going to get a curve like this. And then at 1500 kelvins, you'll get a curve like this. Notice the highest peak, the peak is at a higher frequency. And then at 2000 kelvins, you're going to get a peak at an even higher frequency. But you'll notice the dotted line here, the predicted value, it's going to go up and up and up and up um, without stop all the way to infinity. Uh, at ultraviolet, which would be like around here somewhere, it should go to infinity. Now, so at higher temperature, the peak shifts to the right, which is higher frequency or higher energy, shorter wavelength. And then based on classical physics, that's the prediction here it should just keep going up. There's no reason for it to come back down. And in the ultraviolet, it should actually go um, towards infinity, pretty much. But it doesn't. This mismatch is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And this was predicted by Rowley and Jean, however you say that, John. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section one. We're talking about a black body. A black body, it absorbs all wavelengths, that's why it looks black. Therefore, when you heat it up, it also will emit, emit all wavelengths. Now this is the classical prediction I talked about on the first slide. If you just take the laws of classical physics, classical mechanics, and you try to derive black body radiation, this is what you're going to get. R of nu is equal to 2 pi kT over the speed of light squared times nu squared. Remember. Pi is just a constant, K is Boltzmann constant, T is absolute temperature, C is the speed of light, and then nu is your frequency. So like I said, K is Boltzmann constant. And this is going to go up and up and up with higher and higher frequency until eventually it gets pretty much to infinity and ultraviolet. So this is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now what a black body actually looks like is basically it's just some hollow cavity here. The light comes in a tiny hole and then it'll keep bouncing around, bouncing around, and so eventually it'll get absorbed entirely. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1. So um, we have this formula, nu is equal to C over lambda. Remember, nu is frequency, C is the speed of light, and lambda is wavelength. So like, this frequency is equal to the speed of light over wavelength. Now, we're still talking about black body radiation mostly, but 
Remember, so classical physics, I showed you that formula and how for any temperature, the distribution is going to keep going up and up and up. That means even at room temperature, there's, it should, having a dark black room should be impossible because even at room temperature, everything should be glowing, visible light and ultraviolet light, which we know is not the case. Now, the important thing, the classical formula, it was derived using the equipartition of energy. Remember, we talked about the equipartition before, equip equipartition of energy before, and the degrees of freedom, and, um, you know, there's different ways of storing energy, and we assume that the energy would be stored equally among all those. So, keep that in mind, because we're about to show why that's wrong. Now, also, talking about a black body, I showed you how it's a cavity, it's got a hole in it, and um, since it's a perfect absorber of radiation, when you heat it up, it therefore should also be a perfect emitter of radiation. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1. So, by trial and error, Planck, or Planck, however you say his name, he came up with um, an error, a, a formula. So he started with the assumption that energy, um, which we abbreviate capital E, of course, it could be added or subtracted from the oscillators only in packets, which he called quanta, which is full of quantum, obviously, of size h nu. Now these oscillators he's talking about, he meant vibrating charge, because we're talking about the charged particles, subatomic particles, like um, namely the nucleus. So you might think of atoms vibrating, but think of it more like the nucleus vibrating, which has a positive charge. So in October of 1900, he came up with this formula, that R of nu is equal to A times nu to the third power, E to the B nu over T minus 1. So he solved that, and he got A is equal to 2 pi H over C squared, and B is equal to H over K. Substitute those in, you get R of nu is equal to 2 pi H nu cubed over C squared, e to the h nu divided by kt minus 1. So this is where Planck's constant came from. h is Planck's constant. All these h's are the same. Then of course t is the absolute temperature, k is Boltzmann constant, I mentioned that before. Nu is the frequency, e is just the natural number, 2.718. Uh, nu is the frequency here, c is the speed of light, and then pi is just 3.14, etc. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1 still. So um, what he's saying, Planck, we're still talking about black body radiation, the high energy oscillators, which would equivalent to you know, high frequency light, those don't vibrate. The reason is because we've got this big um, substance, and it's got the energy, and it's going to be dispersed amongst all the oscillators. It's not gonna, they're not going to concentrate in one little spot and be high energy. It could happen, but it's very improbable. So the derivation of that formula on the previous slide, it depends on this important assumption. It's, um, remember heat, it makes the atoms vibrate. That, well, vibrational energy is one type of way that energy gets stored, heat capacity. But we'll get to that in a bit. So Planck, he called these oscillators, but we're talking about the um, vibrating atoms. And he basically, he said that the energy is not going to concentrate in high oscillators. So it's kind of like what I said earlier, the equipartition of energy. The equipartition of energy isn't totally wrong, just not totally applicable either. So what that means is that we rarely get high frequencies because it's, the energy is not going to be concentrated in one spot. So like I said, the energy is not going to concentrate in one atom. It's going to be dispersed throughout. And like we said before, this whole assumption too, it, depends on the idea of energy quantization, that the change in energy um, going into an atom or out of an atom is going to be equal to n h nu. So nu is the frequency, h is that Planck's constant I showed on the previous slide, and n is just any counting number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, without limit to infinity. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 1. So one thing, there's Wien's Law that talks about this. So the maximum wavelength times any temperature is going to be equal to constant. That constant turns out to be 2.898 times 10 to the negative third Kelvin meters. Now the Stefan Boltzmann Law, you might have already seen this before in a physics class. Power is equal to, uh, what is it, sigma times temperature to the fourth. Sigma is going to be 56.4 nanowatts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. So the classical picture 
energy, it can be any level. These must be continuous. It could be this much energy, this much energy, this much energy, totally continuous. Quantum mechanics, or more specifically Planck's model for finding that black body radiation formula, is that there are only certain levels. There's energy level zero, energy level one, energy level two, and they're discrete amounts, and the, yes, there really are gaps in between them. All right, continuing on physical chemistry, we're in chapter 18, section two now. Remember, we already said the second red flag that classical mechanics wasn't quite right was the photoelectric effect. Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for this, not for relativity or anything. So in 1900, Leonard was doing this experiment where he had potassium metal, and he was hitting it with electromagnetic radiation, which has energy H nu. We'll talk about that in a second. So the radiation hits it, and then out comes electrons. Now what he found was that the energy comes in packages. Any amount of energy here, quantity, it came out to a value of n times h nu. n could be any integer. Zero, of course, means nothing's happening. But then one, two, three, all the way to infinity, theoretically. Now remember, we talked already before, nu is the symbol for frequency. And then h is the, um, this constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, if you're NKS units. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section two. So continuing the photoelectric experiments, we're gonna look at several different graphs to explain what happened. So here, one, we're looking at the number of electrons ejected against the light intensity. And what we see here is that it's linear. If you increase the intensity, the number of electrons ejected goes up. Now here, we're doing kinetic energy, or Ke, of these ejected electrons. This is for each electron uh, against frequency. What happens is below a certain threshold, low frequency, you're not going to get any ejected electrons. But then once you get to a certain frequency, which we call, um, what is that, nu naught? Then that would be the threshold frequency. Above that, it's linear. When you increase the frequency, you're going to increase the kinetic energy of each ejected electron. Now this is contrary to classical physics, remember. Classical physics says that you can eject electrons in any light because all you'd have to do is turn up the intensity to get enough energy to knock an electron out of orbit. But as you can see, that's not what happens. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section two, we're still talking about the photoelectric effect here. Here's another graph. Now we're talking about the kinetic energy of each ejected electron versus the light intensity. As you can see, it's a flat line. It does not matter what the light intensity is. As long as you're getting photons, the kinetic energy of each single photon is going to be the same. Now this violates classical physics. But classical physics, the intensity of a wave is proportional to the amplitude of the wave. Notice in this formula, there's no frequency. So, like I said, I is intensity, this alpha just means proportional to. So according to classical physics, wave energy should be independent of frequency, since it just depends on amplitude. <clears throat> Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 2. So in 1905, however you want to say that, 1905, Einstein, he said, electromagnetic radiation, which you might call light, comes in elementary units, or quanta, and it's the energy of the elementary unit, not the total energy, that determines whether an electron is liberated or not. G.M. Lewis called these units photons. So in an analogy, let's say you have a really hard target, like a bunker. You can shoot it all day with machine gun bullets if you want to not cause any damage, but then you shoot with one big 15 inch shell, you destroy the target. So the point is, these two might have the same total energy, but only when it's all at once, not spread out, that it counts. Continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section two. So here we're graphing a capital V for voltage, not potential energy, against nu for frequency. So again, this is gonna be um, just like we saw before with energy. Um, I'll show why in a bit. So below the threshold frequency, you're not going to have any photoelectric effect. 
above the threshold frequency, you're going to have the photoelectric effect. And with increasing frequency, each electron is going to have higher and higher voltage. Now, the slope of this is going to be Planck's constant divided by the charge of the electron. So this, and then um, this, this uh, anyway, h nu is equal to h nu naught plus ke. So you have got the kinetic energy of the electrons plus the h nu naught taken to liberate it with the total h nu of the original incoming photon. Now, like I said, ke is kinetic energy. Now we know ke is equal to one half mv squared, where lowercase v is, means speed. And then that's also the lowercase e times, uh, I guess this would be capital V for voltage. So if you have the charge of an electron times the voltage in that electron, that gives you the energy of that electron. So uh, doing a little algebra here, we get h times nu minus h nu naught is EV. And it, this nu naught is going to be material specific. We're specifically talking about metals, but each different metal is going to have a different value for nu naught. And then again, doing so nu naught, we can solve for h over e is equal to nu minus nu naught is equal to v. This equation here is basically what we graphed up here. That's why the slope is h over e. So this is your y equals mx. Well, it's a weird way of writing it, so the b would be distributed to that. It'd be minus nu naught h over e if you want to do it slope y intercept form. So in this case, the, this is capital V for voltage, and these are both nu, obviously. Now, we know the charge of an electron, lowercase e. Therefore, we can use this to experimentally find a value for Planck's constant h. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 2. So now we have the Planck's constant times the frequency of the incoming photon is equal to phi plus one half mv squared, where we're saying phi is the work function, or the minimum energy it takes to remove an electron. That's the important thing. It takes a certain amount of energy to liberate an electron from the substance. And then, of course, one half mv squared would just be the kinetic energy of the liberated electron. So one, if the um, energy in the incoming photon is calculated by Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. If it's less than the work function phi, then there's going to be no photoelectric effect. The light's just going to get scattered. Now remember, nu naught, the um, cutoff frequency, whatever we call that, is constant for a given metal. So, using phi is equal to eight, uh, the work function is equal to Planck's constant times um, uh, nu naught, uh, phi is going to be constant. The work function is going to be constant for any given metal. And then two, if the incoming, if the energy of the incoming photon is calculated by h times uh, frequency of the photon, if it's greater than phi, then as frequency increases, then so does the kinetic energy of the ejected electron. In other words, the more energy the photon has, the more energy the electron is going to have. So now we've talked about three red flags that classical mechanics wasn't quite matching up with the real world. We talked about heat capacity and how it's um, dependent on temperature, even though classical mechanics says it shouldn't be. We talked about black body radiation and the ultraviolet catastrophe. And now we've talked about the photoelectric effect and how um, we, it, well, it depends on the quantized, quantized energy, not the total wave energy. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 2, we're continuing to talk about the photoelectric effect. And we um, can say that the photoelectric effect, it proves that light behaves as a particle. Because remember, in classical mechanics, um, if you have a wave, that the energy of the wave is going to be determined on the amplitude. But for the light, we've got certain quantities of energy, quantization of energy, which means it's acting as a particle. But light does also have wave properties. For example, we can do diffraction, which is when it gets scattered by a lot of centers, or interference, which is scattering by a few centers. Here's a basic um, interference experiment. So you've got incoming light, perfectly straight line. It's going to go through a hole, a small hole, and it's going to hit a screen. What's the screen going to look like? Well, if you're thinking of light as a particle, you'd expect just one bright dot in the center, everything else black. That's it. 
But this is a very crude drawing showing what's really going to happen. If you're going to get a bright center, it's going to get it's going to have different all areas co-radial, co-centric of bright dark, bright dark. It'll look almost like a bullseye. This is a very crude diagram. Hopefully, you can find a better one on the internet. But um, as you can see, it's not behaving like you would expect a particle to behave. This is because the light is behaving as a wave. Now, getting back to the same formula here, energy equals h nu. We already said that if you have a, a discrete amount of energy, a certain amount of energy, that's a particle concept. It makes perfect sense to say how much energy does a particle have. But this formula h nu, nu is frequency. And of course, it makes sense to talk about the frequency of a wave. How would you talk about the frequency of a particle? Okay, so you know, physical chemistry, chapter 18, we're beginning section 3 now. We're going to talk about the Bohr theory of the hydrogen atom by Niels Bohr, roughly 1913. Now, we talked about black body radiation, and I showed you how you had a nice neat curve from a black body emitting radiation. But it turns out real life lamps, they don't emit a, a black body radiation, they actually emit um, discrete lines. And it, um, for a long time, they had no idea why. So Bohr, he was looking at the hydrogen atom, helium atom. I think he figured it was going to be easiest to figure out what's going on with those two. So he applied quantization to the hydrogen atom. By trial and error, he came up with this formula, that 1 over the wavelength of the light frequency, or 1 over the wavelength of the light, is equal to r times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared, where n1 is just any counting number from 1, 2, 3, etc., and then n2 is any counting number 2, 3, 4, etc. But n2 has to be greater than n1. And then this it, r here is not the gas constant. This is the Rydberg constant. And it's equal to 1.096776 times 10 to the fifth um, wave numbers. Wave number is a unit of energy. So, like I said, spectral lines for a long time they were um, empirical. They had no idea how to drive them, what they meant, or anything. They just knew they were there. So likewise, then you have 1 over the wavelength, that's equal to the wave number. So this symbol here, not just some sort of weird V, we we'll call that wave number. But we're not going to use this very often, so don't worry too much about that. But don't confuse it with the um, nu for frequency. We have lambda times nu, that's equal to the speed of light. You know, physical chemistry, chapter 18, we're in section 3. So, Niels Bohr, he made five postulates. The first three we know to be true, four and five turned out to be false, but we're going to explain them anyway because they're important and they're kind of educational. So, the first one, this one's true. The energy of a hydrogen atom is quantized. You have energy level 1, energy level 2, energy level 3, energy level 4. I didn't draw these to any particular scale, by the way. He called each of these levels a stationary state. And each stationary state it has an allowed amount of energy. Notice these are different energy levels. Now, but as part of the real question is, then why does an electron just fall into the nucleus? Electron has a negative charge. The nucleus has a positive charge. Obviously, they attract each other. Why can't an electron just go all the way down to the nucleus? So question, the second postulate, this one's also true. An electron in a stationary state does not radiate electromagnetic energy energy. It does not radiate energy. And then the third one, this is also true, the, the spectrum, it has emission lines instead of a continuous curve. It results from the transition between the upper, an upper stationary state and a lower stationary state. So by upper and lower we mean higher energy and lower energy. Continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 3. So he said Bohr's postulates made, or Bohr made five postulates, the first three of which are true, and four and five are false. Now the fourth one, he said, that an electron in a hydrogen atom in a stationary state is going to make a circular path around the nucleus. This is wrong. I don't know how he could have thought that, because I think back then they even knew that atoms were spherical, and obviously an electron is going in a circular path. An atom would be flat, not spherical, but anyway. And then number five, the angular momentum of the electron is quantized. That's just from Du Bois' theory. So this is the formula for um, 
angular momentum. You have MVR is equal to NH over 2 pi. Now, M, remember, would be the mass of the electron. V would be the speed of the electron. R would be the radius of its orbit. 2 pi, of course, those are just numbers. H, that would be Planck's constant. And if he threw in the N for quantization, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 3, we're still talking about the Bohr um, model of a hydrogen atom. So remember this formula, we have 1 over lambda equals the um, constant 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Notice this is a difference formula, and it's also in terms of energy. Now this also has Planck's quantization of energy incorporated because of the n terms. So think about this, we have energy is equal to h nu, or that's equal to hc over lambda, which is equal to hc times r times all of this. Okay, so, yeah, I did a little. So hydrogen atom, remember, it has only one electron. So here's a, a Bohr diagram of a, an electron, or a hydrogen atom. You have the nucleus in the center, one proton, and then you have a certain r radius, and then you have the electron going around in circles. Now remember, these two are attracted to each other by the electrical force. Of course, there's gravity too, but gravity is so weak that we can ignore it. Now, remember, an electron, it's moving, right? If it was under no acceleration, it would just continue off in a straight line. Considering that it's not going off in a straight line, it's going around in circles, that tells you there must be some force acting on it. So the electron is being accelerated, and that's what's keeping it in orbit. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 3. So we're talking about an electron orbiting in the hydrogen atom still. We think it's in a stable orbit, as opposed to flying off in the Neverland, which means the force is pulling it in towards the nucleus of the atom, and any forces pushing it away from the nucleus of the atom must be balanced. Now that doesn't mean that it's under no force, though, remember. We showed it must be under acceleration because it's not continuing the straight line. Now Coulomb's law, we're going to be using CGS units for uh, mathematical convenience. We'll be able to avoid some uh, numerical constants doing this. So Coulomb's law, we have force is equal to Z, the atomic number, times the charge squared, or technically the charge of the proton times the charge of the electron, divided by R. And R is the radius, or the distance between those two charges. And then centripetal force, we know force is equal to max times acceleration which is equal to m times v squared over r. v squared over r, this would be the acceleration, of course. Since the, ele the forces on the electron have to be balanced, we can set these two formulas equal to each other. So we get z equals squared, z, the atomic number times the charge squared over r squared is equal to m v squared over r. One of these r's is going to cancel out, so we just get m v squared is equal to z e squared over r. We're going to call this equation 1 because we're going to come back and use it later. Now we know that the total energy in a system, or, well, for one particle like an electron, is going to be its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. So kinetic energy we know is 1 half mv squared. And then the potential energy is going to be minus ze squared over r. So this here, these two together, that's the total energy. We're going to call this equation 2 for uh, reasons later. Now remember, this actually has a minus sign because the proton and the electron, they have opposite charges. So they'll attract each other. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18. This is section 3 still. <coughs> so we're going to substitute equation 1 into equation 2. So we do this two different ways. One, we go energy total is to 1 half. Instead of mv squared, we substitute in z e squared over r plus the negative z squared, z e squared over r, and that becomes minus uh, one half z e squared over r. We'll call that equation three. And likewise, we do the other way around. We get energy total is one half mv squared plus a negative mv squared, and that gives us minus one half mv squared. We'll call that equation four for future reference. Now remember, we talked about MVR, that's the angular momentum. MVR is going to be NH over 2 pi, 
Remember, n is just any counting number for quantization. So, using equation one, we're going to have mvr times v is equal to z e squared, and then uh, n. Let's see, nhv over two pi. That's going to be equal to z e squared. Now, solving for v, we get v is equal to two pi z times e squared over nh. We'll call this equation five. This is the formula for a speed of an electron in a hydrogen atom. So we have v is speed, two pi are numbers, z is the atomic number, one for hydrogen obviously. E, remember that would be the charge of the electron and the proton. And then n would be just one in this case for the first orbital, or two for the next orbital, etc. And then h is just Planck's constant. And like I said, for the first orbital in a hydrogen atom, we get the speed is equal to 9.4 times 10 to the 7 centimeters per second. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 3. So the total energy is going to be minus 2 m pi squared z squared e to the fourth over n squared h squared. And remember, n is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So for hydrogen atom, Everything on the right side here except for n is constant. So if we just say that minus 2 m pi squared z squared e to the 4 n squared h4, oops, I should have the n squared there. That should be 2.18 times 10 to the negative 11 ergs. So for n equals 1, we have the energy is equal to minus 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, or just negative 13.6 electron volts. And then for the next orbital up, n equals 2. E, the energy is equal to minus 5.4 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, or uh, minus 3.40 electron volts. And then for the next n number, n equals 3, the energy is minus 2.42 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, or negative 1.56 electron volts. So as you can see, as n is increasing, E gets less negative. Or should I say, as n approaches infinity, then E approaches zero which would mean that the, at that point the electron is a free electron, it's no longer bound to the nucleus. Now remember, one electron volt is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, or 8,066 wave numbers. And of course, uh, EV is electron volts, the unit of energy. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 3. So I hope you remember those number equations because we're going to substitute equation 5 and equation 1 now. So we get m times this whole quantity squared, nh over 2 pi mr, and that's equal to z times e squared. Solving for r, we're going to get um, r is equal to n squared h squared over 4 pi squared mz e squared. And then um, this whole term over here, put in n equals 1, no, no, n equals 1. Well, anyway, you get, oops, yeah, if you put in n equals 1, you get h squared, remember that's Planck's constant, over 4 pi times the mass of the electron times the atomic number z, that should be 1 for hydrogen atom, times the charge of the electron and the proton times each other, and that is going to give us a naught if you have n equals 1. So that's going to give you 5.29 times 10 to the negative 9 centimeters, or uh, 0.529 angstroms. This is called Bohr's radius because... If you um, remember Bohr's fourth postulate that an electron goes around in circles, this would be the radius of an atom. So we get Rn is equal to 0.529 angstroms times n squared. So let's just think of um, n1 to n2. n1 is going to have a certain energy level, n2 is going to have a certain energy level. And the difference between them, that's going to be the um, energy of the light, incoming light. And that's h nu, calculated by Planck's constant times the frequency. So, just based on this, you know that h nu is equal to e n2 minus e n1. But then substituting in what we have up here, we get minus 2 m times pi squared z squared e to the fourth over n2 squared h squared. So that's the energy of the upper level plus, because it was minus a negative, 2m pi squared z squared e to the fourth over n1 squared over h to the fourth. So then we're just going to do a little, we're going to factor out all these different constants. So we get h nu is equal to 2 pi squared mz squared e to the fourth over h squared. And then this becomes minus 1 over n2 squared plus 1 over n1 squared. Now we're going to divide both sides by h 
So we have the frequency by itself is equal to 2 pi squared times the mass of the electron times the atomic number squared times the charge of the electron or proton to the fourth power. Obviously, this is going to be a positive value at this point, so it doesn't matter. Divided by Planck's constant to the cubed. And then all that times the quantity 1 over n2 squared plus or minus 1 over n2 squared plus 1 over n1 squared. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, this is the last of section 3. So uh, I think I explained before that the frequency is equal to the speed of light over the wavelength. And so the 1 over the wavelength is equal to um, the frequency divided by the speed of light. So now we're going to have 1 over lambda, the, the wavelength is equal to 2 pi squared times mz squared e to the fourth over c um, h cubed. Or C is the speed of light, H is Planck's constant, E is the charge of a proton or electron, Z is the atomic number, M is the mass of the electron, pi, of course, is just the number pi, and then lambda is the wavelength. All these are constants over here. And then we still have that quantity minus 1 over n2 squared plus 1 over n1 squared. So we replace all these constants with one big constant, and this is going to be called R. So we get 1 over lambda is equal to r times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. r is called the Rydberg constant. I mentioned before this is not the ideal gas constant, or just the gas constant. Now, what's interesting, this formula is actually correct, even though we remember we, debased, we derived it based on um, Bohr's model of the atom, which had uh, two false assumptions. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18. Now we're in section 4. We're talking about the de Broglie or de Bois hypothesis. This is from 1928. Now, de Broglie or de Bois, de Bois whatever you say, he's a, he was a French physicist. And he was saying, well, if wave can behave as a particle, maybe matter can behave as a wave. So, yeah, we have this formula. Energy is equal to h nu that we had for a photon. But we also have energy equals mc squared. So, why not use the transitivity of equality and say h nu is equal to mc squared? Now, we also know that nu is equal to c over lambda. Remember, c is the speed of light, lambda is wavelength, nu is frequency. So, doing a little algebra substitution, we get Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. And therefore, Planck's constant divided by the wavelength is equal to mass times the speed of light. So, we're going to use, um, instead of c for the speed of light, matter can't go to the speed of light, so we're actually going to put in v for velocity. So we get lambda is equal to Planck's constant divided by mass divided by velocity, or speed. This is called the Broglie's equation. It's very important, obviously. So um, we're going to use MKS units. So lambda would be in meters, a, uh, Planck's constant would be in joule seconds, and the m would be in kilograms, MKS units. So we're done with CGS units for now. And like I said, v is... Um, speed instead of the speed of light because matter can't go the speed of light. And then also, um, mv, that's momentum. So we could also write as lambda is equal to Planck's constant divided by uh, p or rho, depending on who your teacher is, for linear momentum. <laughs> now we're continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 4. So I showed you before, lambda is equal to Planck's constant over um, the momentum. So lambda, the wavelength, that is a concept that makes perfect sense for waves. But then h over momentum, that is a concept that makes sense for particles. So like I said, lambda is a wave property, but momentum depends on m, and m is a particle property. So this is kind of getting into wave-particle duality which is based partly on uh, lambda is equal to Planck's constant over mv. mv would be equal to momentum here. So this here is the topic for de Broglie's thesis for his PhD, or de Bois, however you say his name. And um, Einstein read it, and Einstein said it was an interesting idea. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, uh, section 4 still. So electrons are standing waves. Think about this. This would be a hydrogen atom. If we had um, Bohr was right, there would be just a circle. The electron would be going in a circle. 
but instead you can think of it as the electrons went out and in and out and in and out and in. The important thing is once it's come full circle, it's come back where it started. So if you look at it, it looks stationary, it's not moving. So there are two kinds of waves. One is a traveling wave. That means the position of these crests and these troughs, they're not moving. They'd be rotated or they're free to move around and do whatever they want. And the other kind is standing waves. And that means that the position of all these crests and these troughs, they're um, not moving, they're stationary. Continuing on physical chemistry, we're in chapter 18, section 4 now. So let's um, do this, this computation for a, macroscopic a microscopic object. Let's say we have the mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31, negative 31 kilograms. And um, the speed of the electron is 1.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is something you might expect in the first orbital. Then the wavelength of that electron is 7 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, or 7 angstroms. Now that is something that can be detected or observed. Now on the other hand, let's say we have a much larger object, like 1 gram, and the speed is, let's say, 1 centimeter per second. Obviously that's pretty arbitrary. But then the lambda is going to be 7 times 10 to the negative 27 centimeters, or 7 times 10 to the negative 19 angstroms. So what that tells us is that for a macroscopic object, quantum effects are unobservable. Continuing on physical chemistry, we're in chapter 18, beginning section 5 now, we're going to talk about the uncertainty principle. Now, we, um, from before, in the previous section, we said electron diffraction, it shows electrons have wave-like properties. That's what we're going to be doing this experiment right here. So we're going to simplify the symbol Vx to mean the velocity component along the x-axis, which is up and down this way, and then the Px we're going to use for the momentum along the x-axis, up and down this way, and then y is this way. So we have an electron beam coming this way. It's coming through this wall. It's got a tiny hole in it. Um, we're going to say this is our slit. And our slit has a certain width. And then it's going to come across here to this fluorescent screen. The fluorescent screen is um, quite a distance d across this way. Now, if electrons behaved as particles, ignoring their charge, of course, but if it, you would accept them to keep going in a straight line and hit e. In which case, you should see a bright dot here and nothing else. But instead, what is going to happen is it actually has wave-like properties. It radiates out here, and it makes this weird pattern on the side here. You get the bright spot in the center, and then dark spots, and the bright spots, and dimmer, dimmer and dimmer, bigger and bigger, just like we showed a few slides ago. Now, we labeled some of these points here. <clears throat> so, like, here we have A, D, and C, and the angle between them is theta. And then you have this point, P, out here. P is where you see this first um, dark spot. So this angle here is alpha. Hopefully you can read that small size. And the mirror image would be Q. But we only need to talk about one side. What's true for up here is going to be true for down there also. In fact, if this is actually two-dimensional, these are concentric circles. So these are just two of the points on that whole circle anyway. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 5, we're talking about the uncertainty principle. Remember the same diagram from the previous slide. So um, line segment AC is perpendicular to line segment DP, and the length of line segment AP is equal to the length of line segment CP. Now we want DP minus AP to be one half lambda. I'll show you why in a bit. Remember, lambda is the wavelength of the light. Now we're actually talking about electrons, so this is actually going to be the uh, wavelength of the electrons. So, and that's going to be equal to CD. So CD, this distance here, it has to, but remember how this fits into the big diagram we had on the previous slide. This is much larger than before. This C, that length, CD, has to be one half lambda for destructive interference. Destructive interference is where I showed you the point of minimum intensity, as opposed to constructive interference where you have maximum uh, intensity. So this here is a graph. The dark one is our original um, wave. It could be electrons in this case. So the dotted line is the opposite. You'll notice it's out of phase by one half wavelength. When you do this, it adds up to zero. So that's why we say for destructive interference, you have to be one half wavelength out of phase. Now remember the diagram. The width 
or the distance between the plate and the uh, slit D is much greater than the width of the slit W. So that angle we had over here by point P, alpha, we're going to say that's roughly equal to zero. We're going to be taking advantage of this to do some simplifications. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 5, we're talking about the uncertainty principle. So um, the distance, remember, that's the same or, you know, from the slit to the uh, fluorescent screen, that's the same as the dis length of segment DE. We know that D is greater than W, we said that before, so we're going to approximate with alpha is equal to zero. So, given that, we're going to say, okay, ACD is just equal to 90 degrees, alpha P, or angle PAC is equal to angle ACP, that's equal to 90 degrees. And remember, angle PDE and angle DAC, that's equal to theta. So we have 90 degrees is equal to ADC plus theta. Now, we're going to say the sine theta then is equal to the length of segment DC divided by the length of AD. DC is one half lambda, and AD is one half the width. Therefore, the one halves cancel out, and you get sine of theta is equal to lambda over W. Remember, lambda would be the wavelength of, um, in this case, the electrons, and W would be the slit width. Now that would be the, the angle for the first diffraction minimum. So this is how it's going to look. We have, coming through here, we've got our angle of theta, and then when we hit the screen, this is where you would expect the particle, but this is where you get a diffraction minimum instead. So, Px, now if x was down here, if our particle was down here at this height, it started out having no vertical, having no component of momentum x component of momentum. But if it got out to here, it must have moved in the x-axis. So now, it must have an x component of momentum. So we're going to say the x component of momentum is just equal to the momentum times sine of theta by, you know, your trigonometric identities. And then, of course, this distance that we moved to delta x, that's going to be the same as the um, slit width. Now, w is very narrow. This isn't going to work if you use a, uh, use a huge slit. <clears throat> Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 8, section 5, 18, section 5. So the change in the momentum of x is going to be p sine theta minus negative p sine theta. That's because, remember, it's going to go both up and down for those two different destructive interferences. So the change in the momentum is actually 2 times p times the sine of theta. Now remember, sine is an odd function, which means if you have sine of minus theta, it's the same as minus sine theta. For comparison, cosine is an even function, which means if you have cosine of minus theta, it's just cosine of theta. Now, so we have delta, the momentum in x, is equal to 2 p times lambda divided by the width. We're going to use the de Broglie and say lambda is equal to h over momentum. So then we have the delta momentum in x is equal to 2 times the momentum times uh, Planck's constant divided by the width times the momentum. These momentums, momenta, cancel out, so we get just 2h over w. So um, I said this before in the previous slide, I didn't explain it very well. So if we have a very, very narrow slit, then we'll say that, um, just say that the width is going to be the same as delta x. Obviously that won't, this is a very simplistic approximation, but it helps with the math. So then the change in the momentum is x, in x is just 2h over delta x. Rewriting that, we get delta x delta px is equal to 2h, and h is Planck's constant, which is a very small value. Now, somehow, I can't really explain, but that gives us delta momentum of x times the delta x, think of it momentum position, is greater than or equal to the Planck's constant, or the Planck length, over 2 pi. But what's interesting is you can get slightly different values for this depending on how you actually derive it. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 5. So what we've learned is that the uncertainty, I was writing delta, but that doesn't necessarily mean change, it really means uncertainty. The uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position, or location, you know, I was writing that x because we were in one dimension, is at least Planck's constant. Now that's true in all three dimensions. We have delta x times delta px is greater than or equal to h, 
delta y times delta py greater than or equal to h, and delta z times delta pz is greater than or equal to h. Remember, this is position, momentum, momentum, position, momentum, position. Now, Bohr was fascinated with orbits. Remember, he's the one who came up with the Bohr orbital diagram we did a few sections ago. Now, he know, they knew that planets have definite orbits. The Mercury goes around the Sun, Venus goes around the Sun, etc. But if an electron actually did that, it, if it was in a definite orbit, like he was thinking of an um, electron going in a perfect circle, then the uncertainty of the radius would be zero. But based on this formula, if you have radius here and the momentum, radial momentum, then you get delta, the uncertainty of the momentum would be infinite. And then the uncertainty in the velocity would be infinite. Now, that can't be true because we know an electron, it, it can't go past the speed of light anyway. And then, now, so we remember R is radius, P is momentum, and then V is velocity. Continuing on physical chemistry, we're in chapter 18, section 5 now. So remember we said angular momentum is mass times speed times the radius, and that's equal to the counting number n times Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Now let's talk about the 1s shell for an atom. Now next chapter we're actually going to talk a lot more about orbitals, but this will do for now. So this 1s shell has no orbital momentum, that's because it has spherical symmetry, L equals 0. So for an electron in an S shell, imagine this is a hydrogen atom, your nucleus is here, and the electron, it's not at a fixed radius, it's going in and out. And that's partly because of that uncertainty principle I showed on the previous slide. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, we're finishing up section 5 now. Let's say we have this sealed container. Of course, it's not totally, it, well anyway, the cat's in here, right? We have a radioactive atom, and we have a radiation detector over here, raised to a hammer, which is above a, a sealed vial of hydrogen cyanide gas. If this detector detects radioactive particle, it'll release the hammer, destroy the vial, the hydrogen cyanide will be out here for the cat to breathe, and the cat will die. So like I said, if the detector finds a radioactive particle, it releases hammer, releases the hydrogen cyanide gas, kill the cat. From, in the sealed system, there is no way to know whether the cat is dead or alive. In fact, according to wave theory, a particle, it can be two places at the same time. The cat both dead and alive. Think about that uncertainty of position we talked about. If the particle is this way, it's got an uncertainty here. Maybe the radioactive particle will hit the detector, maybe not. If it hits the detector, cat's dead. If it doesn't hit the detector, cat's alive. And according to wave theory, it does both. It hits the detector and it misses the detector, so the cat is both alive and dead. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, we're starting section 6 now. Now we can finally do quantum mechanics. Now, there are two types of quantum mechanics. There's wave mechanics and there's matrix mechanics. We're only going to be doing wave mechanics. There's no need to learn both. Now Schrodinger, he's the one who came up with wave mechanics. He was a mathematical physics. Now Dirac, or Dirac, I think it's Dirac, and Heisenberg, they're the ones who came up with matrix mechanics. But matrix mechanics and wave mechanics, they both have the same results, so there's no need to learn both. Now for photons, electrons, protons, any other subatomic particles, classic mechanics does not work. It doesn't get the correct results. So what we need to do is use quantum mechanics, one or the other. Now, for macroscopic objects, classical physics still gives the correct results. So we don't need to try to apply quantum mechanics to uh, large objects, microscopic objects. As size gets larger, the quantum it's gonna, it emerges into classical anyway. So the classical works. Okay, con <coughs> excuse me. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6, uh, we're talking about quantum mechanics. First, a quick review of classical mechanics, what it is and what it means, more importantly. So we know force is mass times acceleration, which is mass times the second derivative of position with respect to time. That's if we're talking about one dimension. Obviously, it'd be the same in the other three dimensions, no problem. Now, if we integrate that twice, then we get uh, the position x is a function of time, c1 and c2, where c1 and c2 are two integration constants. 
Now, the important thing, though, is that the state of the system is specified once we define all forces on the system, namely the position and velocity of every molecule. For example, let's say we start at time equals zero. Then our uh, position x, we'll just say x0 or x0, and then our time is going to be t0, t0, and then our speed or velocity is going to be uh, v0, v0. So, again, at time equals zero, then the position is going to be a function of t0, c1, and c2, and then the speed is going to be the derivative of that. So using those two, we've got the whole, everything you need to know about the system. So once we have that, that's the state of our system, we can predict where every particle will be and its velocity. In other words, in classical mechanics, we can precisely predict or calculate what large objects are going to do. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. We're in quantum mechanics now. The state of the system is defined by this capital letter psi, spelled PSI, but it's written like this. Notice these horizontal things are important to denote that it's a capital psi. Now we're talking about microscopic objects only, like way down at the atomic scale. Now, the state, we talk, had a definition in thermodynamics, but in quantum mechanics, state has a different definition. The state of the system is defined by this mathematical function, psi. Psi is time dependent. It's a wave function. So psi is not a physical wave. Worst case scenario, that's what this wave is made of. It's not a water wave or sound wave or anything like that. It's not a physical wave of any kind. All it really is, it's a wave type equation that represents a physical system. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. So we have this capital psi function. Psi, it gives the outcome of a measurement of any property of the system. Examples of what you might measure are the position, the momentum, the angular momentum, the energy, etc. We'll be learning how to do all these in just a little bit. Now, psi is not a physical wave, I mentioned that before. It represents a physical system. Now, the system, it could be an atom, one molecule, one electron, etc. It doesn't really matter as long as it's at the, you know, really small scale. Now, psi Everything that can be known is in this function psi, because the psi is the state function in quantum mechanics. But unfortunately, it does not have everything that we wish to know. Remember, classical mechanics, we can predict exactly the position, momentum of every particle. But with quantum mechanics, there are limits to how much you can know. And this psi has everything that we can know. Now, for a multi-particle system, then, psi is a function of the xyz position of particle 1, xyz position of particle 2, etc., all the way to xyz position of particle n, and then, of course, t for time. So remember, xyz, these are Cartesian coordinates, t is time, so xyz, this would be the x1, y1, z1, that would be the position of the first particle, electron in an atom. Um, x2, y2, z2, that would be a position of the second particle, like an electron, electron in an atom, etc. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. So, psi, even though it's talking about a real system, it's, described, it's the state function for a real system, it's a complex function. So it's written in the form of a plus ib. Remember, i is the square root of negative 1. So psi is going to have a complex conjugate, which we denote psi star. And psi star, if psi is a plus ib, psi star must be a equals i minus b. Now a and b are not constants. They are real functions of the coordinates and t for time. Now how does psi change with time and the coordinates? Now I'll show you the equation on the next slide, but first remember h bar is equal to h over 2 pi. So h is the um, Heisenberg uh, no, Planck's constant. And then, um, so we say h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2p. And then m is going to be the mass of a particle. So m1 is mass of particle 1, m2 is mass of particle 3, mn would be the mass of particle n. Now, the capital V is potential energy, and then of course lowercase t is time. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. This is the equation I was warning you about. 
So we have minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass of particle 1 times the second derivative of psi with respect to the um, x position of particle 1 plus the second derivative of psi with respect to the y position of particle 1 plus the second derivative of um, psi function with respect to the z position of particle 1 minus etc, etc, all the way to minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass of particle n times the uh, second derivative of the psi function with respect to the x position of particle n plus the second derivative of psi with respect to the uh, y position of particle n plus the uh, um, psi, second derivative of the psi function of the uh, z position of particle n plus the potential energy times the um, psi equals minus h bar divided by i, remember i is the square root of minus 1, times the derivative of psi with respect to t. Now, that's a second order partial differential equation. The important thing is, it's postulated by Schrodinger. It's not derived in any way, just like when you are Newton mechanics, you are given forces mass times acceleration. That's postulated too, it can't really be derived. Okay, continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. Now, we've been doing wave mechanics, we're going to keep doing wave mechanics, but just as an aside, um, we just came up with the equation for wave mechanics, and we said it's postulated, not derived, just like classical mechanics. And just so you know, matrix mechanics is the same way. They have their way of doing things, and it too is postulated, not derived. So we have our differential equation. Differential equation is not a prerequisite for this class, but just so you know, the, the way to solve a differential equation, you have your differential equation. When you solve it, all you've got is a general solution. Then what you do is you apply your boundary conditions. That's going to give you your particular solution. The particular solution you can use to find physical quantities, which is what we want, such as energy, momentum, angular momentum, position, and so on. Now, remember, we're using capital V for uh, potential energy. Potential energy for each particle is going to be a function of its position, x, y, z, and of t for time, maybe. Now, t, if, if you have a system with like no external fields, time won't actually make any difference. But if you've got like some sort of field, external field, and the field keeps changing, then yes, your potential energy is going to change with time. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. So then the derivative of potential energy with respect to x is equal to minus the force in x, or the x component of the force. Now, the Born postulate. Born said that the square of the absolute value of psi means probability. Now remember, for complex numbers, if you take a complex number times its complex conjugate, or complex function times its complex conjugate, that's the same as um, the absolute value squared. So if you want the absolute value, you just take the square root of all sides. So the absolute value of the function psi is just the square root of psi star times psi. Remember, psi and psi star are the complex conjugates. And it doesn't matter which is which, they're opposites, like mirror images. So for one dimension, psi is just a function of x and t. We're going to be using that later on. For example, let's say that we have some sort of system, and we want to know the probability that x is in a certain range, let's say a to b. Well, if you've taken probability statistics, you know that that's just the integral from a to b of this probability with respect to x. So the probability would be the absolute value squared, just like we had before. So this um, absolute value of psi is a function of x and t squared d times the differential of x. This is proportional to probability. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 6. I know this can be disturbing for some of you, but there is no equation of motion for an electron. The best we can do is find probability of what it's doing. We cannot define a path for an electron. Now, to speak in probability then, the integral from minus infinity to the absolute value of psi squared with respect to x is going to be equal to 1, because there's a 100% chance of probability 
finding the particle somewhere. Now, being equal to 1, this is called the normalization condition. We're going to be using that later on when we find out an actual equation or a function for psi. Now, in three dimensions then, of course, you'd be x, y, z separately. So you'd have the integral from minus infinity and minus infinity and minus infinity. That's a triple integral of psi as a function of x, y, z and time squared, or the absolute value, of course. And then, of course, you have your dx, dy, dz, because you have three integrals, dx, dy, dz. And this, too, has to be equal to 1, again, because there's a 100% chance of finding the particle somewhere in space. Now, this gets repetitive, dx, dy, dz, so instead we're going to abbreviate it. We have tau, and d tau is going to be just dx, dy, dz. So all of this can be rewritten as the integral of psi, oops, that should still be psi squared, d tau, and that's equal to 1. So this means the triple integral over all space is equal to 1. Okay, continue now physical chemistry, chapter 18. We're in section 7 now. Uh, in section 6, we found the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Now, in section 7, we're going to talk about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, this funny-looking O with the two dots on it, that's called an umlaut. Um, an isolated system in quantum mechanics means that the external forces are not changing with time. So that means in an isolated system, the acting force is just a function of x, y, and z, and therefore the potential energy is also a function of just x, y, and z. No time, no time. So here we have the time-dependent Schrodinger's equation, which in one dimension is a function of just x and t. But we're going to separate out the variables. We're going to have a function of t, and then we're going to have psi of x. Remember, this is capital psi, this is lowercase psi. Capital psi is not equal to lowercase psi. Remember, we're using capital psi for the time-dependent one, and we're going to use lowercase psi for the time-independent one. So we have minus h bar squared over 2m, as the second derivative of psi with respect to x, plus the potential energy, which is a function of just x, and that's going to be equal to minus h bar over i times the derivative of psi with respect to t. Now this, you should look familiar, it's the time-dependent one, with only one variable, uh, x. Now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in to get the time-independent form. So we're going to have the second derivative of psi with respect to x squared. That's equal to a function of time times the derivative of the second derivative of psi with respect to x squared. And then we're going to have the derivative of psi with respect to time. That's going to be equal to this lowercase psi of x is equal to the derivative of f with respect to t. t is time, f is the function. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 7 now. So we have minus h bar squared, remember h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, divided by 2m, m is the mass of the particle, times the function of time, times the second derivative of lowercase psi with respect to x, with res yeah, with respect to x, plus the chemical potential, or the potential energy as a function of x, times that same function of t, times the... Uh, psi function, lowercase psi of x, and that's equal to h bar over i, remember i is the square root of negative 1, times psi of x times the derivative of that function with respect to time. Sorry if my f and my t looks the same, but anyway. So we have, remember f prime is the derivative of x with respect to t. So we're going to divide by f of t up here, and what we're going to end up with is minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x, plus V of x, or so chemical, or the potential energy is a function of x times the um, psi of x, and that's equal to h bar over i times the f prime of t divided by f of t psi of x. Now this here, this term, h bar over i times f prime over t divided by f of t, that actually is a constant. It's called energy. So we have minus h bar squared divided by 2m is times the second derivative 
Oops, that should be psi of x. <laughs> okay, psi of x with respect to x plus the chemical potential of um, x times the psi of x is equal to the energy of the system times psi of x. So what this tells us is that we have our kinetic energy plus our potential energy is equal to the total energy. Now remember, m would be the mass of the one particle that we're interested in. And this here, this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 7. So in three dimensions, we'll have minus h bar squared divided by 2 times the mass of particle 1 times the second derivative of psi with respect to x plus the second derivative of psi with respect to y plus the second derivative of psi with respect to... Oops, that should be z. Ha ha. All right. Anyway. And this is lowercase psi, remember, because we're talking about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And then et cetera, et cetera, for all the particles up to n. Oh, I screwed that up twice. This should be z. Okay, so we have minus h bar squared times 2 times the mass of particle n times the derivative, second derivative of psi with respect to the x position of particle n plus the second derivative of psi with respect to the y position of particle n plus the second derivative of the z of psi with respect to the z position of particle n plus the chemical or the potential energy times psi, and that's equal to the E times psi. Now remember V, the, chem, the potential energy is a function of x, y, and z, but not time, because this is the time-independent equation. And likewise, psi is a function of x, y, z, but not time, because this is the time-independent equation. Now, speaking of states, remember psi is our state function. Well, we have two, capital psi and lowercase psi are both state functions. If, if states that have definite energy for which the probability distribution is independent of time are called stationary states. So for stationary states, we have the derivative of um, the absolute value of capital Psi with respect to time, and that's in, or capital Psi squared with respect to time, that's equal to zero. And likewise, we got the derivative of the square of the absolute value of Psi with respect to time is equal to to zero. So both of these are going to be equal to zero for a stationary state. So remember, psi is a probability distribution function. So for a stationary state, the probability distribution doesn't change with time. But that doesn't mean the particle isn't moving. Quite the contrary, the particle has to be still moving. It's got momentum. It's just, it, and it's not even necessarily moving at a constant speed because, you know, it can be changing radius. All it means is that the overall distribution, the probability distribution of where the particle can be, that's not changing over time. And likewise, as you can see by this equation, E is a constant, so energy is constant with time for a stationary state. Okay, now we're in uh, physical chemistry, chapter 18, section 7. We're talking a little bit more about the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, we know psi is some sort of equation, but what's it going to be like? Well, we know a few rules that psi must follow. One, it has to be single-valued. In mathematical terms, it has to be a function. For example, you see this example here? This doesn't pass what you might call the vertical line test. You see here, it could be this or this or this. So this is not a function. So whatever this is, that could not be a valid um, solution to the Schrodinger equation. It also has to be continuous. For example, you see how this function here, it's got a gap. This is discontinuous, so this would not be a valid uh, solution to the Schrodinger equation. And likewise, it has to be quadratically integrable. What that means is that the definite integral from minus infinity to infinity has to be a constant value. For example, it can't be like this, y equals x squared. You see y equals x squared is probably goes up for infinity. So the integral over all space of the absolute value of psi squared, remember d tau means all space, it has to equal some sort of finite number. Now eventually one equal to one, but if that happened to be a different constant, we can always just divide by that constant and it'll become one. So let's say we did try at y is equal to f of x equals x squared. Well, then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of uh, psi squared dx for that example would be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the fourth dx, which would be one-fifth x to the fifth 
integrated from minus infinity to infinity. Now, not worrying about whether there's a difference between infinity and two infinity, this is not going to be a constant, it's going to be infinite. So what that tells us is that x squared is not quadratically integrable, and therefore it would not um, work as a solution for the Schrodinger equation. Continue on physical chemistry, chapter 18, um, section 7. So if a function meets all three criteria on the previous slide, we say it's well behaved. Or put it another way, the wave function, which meets all of those conditions, is said to be well behaved. Now psi is well behaved, but only for certain values of energy. Capital E is energy, of course. So remember, before we were writing psi as a function of x1, y1, z1, etc., to x1, n, y, n, z, n, and t, now we're saying, okay, as long as it's the time, in, or the, yeah, the time independent, uh, yeah, the short answer equation, then it'd be a function of x, y, z of each particle, and then the energy of the system. So for an isolated system, there can be several stationary states, and each one of those states is going to be represented by its own wave function, psi. Okay, continuing on physical chemistry, chapter 18. We're finishing up section 7 now. So what about the potential energy, V? Well, if you have an isolated system, which is one that's not influenced by an external field, such as an electric field or magnetic field, um, namely if we have like one molecule or an atom or whatever, then the chemical or the potential energy V is independent of time, and the system can exist in a stationary state. 